Welcome to the Champs App Podcast, where we help players and parents demystify the world of minor hockey development and recruiting for both girls and boys. On today's episode, I talk with Brian Adolski, who is the head coach of the St. Cloud State Women's Hockey Program. We talk about his lengthy hockey coaching career, including what happened with the North Dakota Women's Hockey Program, coaching the Chinese women's hockey team at the Olympics, and how he has turned the St. Cloud State Program into a top 10 team in his first two years. This was an amazing conversation with Brian, so I hope you enjoy it. Before we get to this amazing episode, I wanted to give you an update on Champs App. We continue to make enhancements to Champs App, and this year we will be adding some amazing new features to help with your hockey journey. Champs App is a digital hockey network. With Champs App, you can create a beautiful free hockey resume. Whether you are a hockey player, team coach, development coach, parent, or advisor or agent, you can create a personalized profile that fits your role in the hockey community. Once your free profile is created, you can connect with team coaches, development coaches, parents, and players. No matter your role, you can now add key contacts to show everyone who the key folks are that you work with, work with you, or are helping you out. It's like the LinkedIn for hockey. If you are a player, when you connect with coaches, they will receive automatic updates when you change your profile, add game video, or alert them to upcoming games on your schedule. Just go to www.champs.app and click the sign up button to start your profile. You can check out the full list of the NCAA coaches using Champs app by clicking on the links in the show notes. We also have more exciting features coming soon to help you get noticed in time for the upcoming recruiting and training season. Now, let's get to this amazing episode. I am very excited to have on the podcast Brian Nadolski, who is the head coach of the St. Cloud State Women's Hockey Program. Originally from Warren, Michigan, just outside Detroit, Brian played D3 college hockey at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. Following a four-year professional career and coaching for one year in the Central Hockey League, Brian returned to his alma mater at Stevens Point as the head coach of the women's team, where he took the team to new heights during his five-year tenure. He then moved on as an assistant coach at St. Cloud State for a single year before becoming the head coach for 10 years at the now-defunct D1 program at the University of North Dakota. When the program was eliminated, he continued his coaching career in China, which included coaching the Chinese women's team in the Beijing Olympics. For the past two seasons, he has been the head coach at St. Cloud State. Last year, Brian was the USCHO National Coach of the Year and WCHA Coach of the Year after doubling the team's wins in his first season uh, from 9 to 18 as the Huskies head coach. Welcome to the podcast, Brian. Thanks. Appreciate you that's, having me. That's uh, quite the long career that we're going to get into. So why don't we uh, do like we all with all our guests, uh, maybe just share how you uh, started playing hockey in Detroit and uh, how you ended up uh, playing uh, college hockey at Wisconsin Stevens Point. Yeah, for sure. No, uh, so uh, hockey wise, my uh, father had no background. No one in my family had uh, played. Uh, dad took me to go see uh, a hockey uh, game. His uh, one of his buddies from work, son, was playing high school hockey, and uh, I, I guess I enjoyed it. He asked me if I wanted to skate, and I absolutely loved it, and uh, have been playing ever since. So that was kind of how I got into it at uh, the youth level. Um, was lucky enough uh, to progress and uh, move through different teams and opportunities as a younger player and uh, play AAA and then play uh, some junior hockey in the North American League. And then, then from there, going to uh, Wisconsin Stevens Point, who at the time was uh, the best uh, Division three program in the country. And uh, that's really why I wanted to go there. They had won three straight, and that had appealed to me. I had some success in uh, youth hockey, winning state titles, and junior hockey, and winning league and playoff. And so uh, that was definitely part of the experience I was looking for out of uh, college as well. So, And at the time, I know you played defense. Um, and I know in your pro career, you were kind of more of a uh, defensive defenseman. But at that time growing up, were you uh, more of an offensive D? And were you able to contribute when you got to the college level and the junior level? So uh, interesting enough, I started playing D. And then uh, probably through squirts, I'm not entirely sure how that transitioned. But I played forward. So I was playing a forward uh, through uh, kind of squirt and into Bantam and then uh, midget. And it was really coming out of midget that I kind of transitioned back to, to defense. So uh, fortunate enough to play both. I think that really helped my game as far as seeing the ice and being able to uh, 
move pucks in transition. And um, yeah, I would never say I was offensively gifted, though I like to uh, remind people in Bantams that I led uh, the AAA league in goals, but that was because Doug Waite was uh, bouncing stuff off of me in front of the net. It really wasn't because I was creating stuff. So uh, fortunate to play with some pretty good players uh, in my youth career growing up in Michigan. Gotcha. All right. And um, following your college career, uh, you played a few years of pro hockey. And I know in your first year, um, you played in Madison for Mark Johnson, the current coach of Wisconsin. And I was just wondering, is, is it a coincidence that you played for him? Or is there a correlation that you both ended up play, uh, coaching women's hockey? Um, I, it's just, uh, I think our paths are both really interesting in that regard with those opportunities in the early days uh, kind of popped up for both of us. And, um, you know, I, I can't speak for Mark, but I know for me that I, I just enjoyed the initial uh, experience, didn't know what to expect, but the players were awesome. And so obviously to be a part of developing the sport and growing it, it's been a lot of fun in my career. So, yeah, that Madison Monster team actually has uh, uh, four coaches. Uh, three of us have coached in the Olympics. Um, so it was a pretty good group. Uh, Mark, uh, Brett Larson, who's the men's coach, who is also coaching USA uh, hockey, uh, not only in the World Juniors this past year, but also on the men's side in Beijing. Uh, Danny Laughlin, who's uh, the head coach of Superior uh, Wisconsin Division Three, has been doing it forever. And then uh, myself. So it's very interesting when you go back through that, uh, you know, four of us coming out of that group uh, ended up doing some pretty neat things coaching wise. It's a impressive coaching tree there for Mark then from uh, that one season then. Um, I'm curious, uh, what was it that made you decide that you wanted to actually be a coach? It was always um, something in the back of my mind even coming up in the junior hockey about what kind of jobs opportunities could there be to continue to play um you know everyone wants to play in the nhl and like that's the highest level but i think at an earlier age i kind of understood that that uh i wasn't that type of player and, and i wasn't uh, that talented though i enjoyed playing and very passionate about it and a lot of people had uh, encouraged me um, when I was younger as well, thinking that I had a pretty good head for the game and having conversations uh, about the game at a higher level and kind of explaining structure, systems, concepts. And I, I just always kind of gravitated towards that and enjoyed that. So a lot of people say uh, that uh, I, I might be pretty good at it and encourage me to kind of go along that path growing up. Gotcha. And now correct me if I'm wrong, you actually didn't complete your degree on time. You turned pro before finishing your degree. Um, so uh, explain to folks how you uh, went and finished your degree and then how you ended up coaching back at your alma mater, the uh, the women's team. Well, I'm uh, old enough where online classes uh, wasn't really a thing. So uh, I just wanted to go play. So right out of uh, uh, graduate or not even graduation, finishing uh, my senior season and eligibility, I went and played some pro roller hockey uh, and really enjoyed that, thought that was cool. Um, and then uh, you go into training camp. I just really assumed, right, I'd play a year. I, I didn't have any great expectations. I thought it would be a cool opportunity to grow, um, get exposed to another coach and philosophy and um yeah next thing i knew it turned into five years and uh it was pretty important for me at that point to to go back and uh, finish my degree gotcha and and did that help you actually get the coaching job because you now had uh, uh an actual degree from the school well they definitely want you to have a degree some schools are a little more willing to kind of work with you if you haven't finished it up and obviously being my alma mater they were they were fine with that so i actually originally went back was finishing my degree and working kind of as a ga with the men's program the women's program had just started a gentleman by the name of jason lesterberg was the first coach there at stevens point jason went on to go coach at bemidji and then St. Cloud himself, um, but uh, he left for Bemidji after the first season there, and then so it was the middle of the summer, 
Uh, I had some designs and uh, opportunities to go coach junior hockey on the boys' side, and uh, that fell through. And like literally two days later, they asked if I would take over the women's program. Uh, and I said, uh, you know, I'd do it for a year. Wasn't sure I'd be any good at it or how it would go. You know, I used to walk by practice every day for on the women's side. And it was at a point where they weren't doing flow drills because they couldn't make three or four passes in a row. And it was very much like hockey school and stationary skill stuff and skating and you know, I just coached pro hockey two years before. I wasn't sure how that was going to go for me. But uh, the kids coming in were awesome. Uh, taught me a lot about uh, being able to communicate and break down uh, different drills, structure. And, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. That first team went 26-1. and one. Wow. Uh, and I've been coaching women's hockey ever since, so. Wow, that's a, that's an amazing turnaround. So I, I want to get into your coaching uh, in in just a moment. But um, according to your elite prospects profile, it says that you played five games in um, two thousand and five uh, professionally, six years after you retired from hockey. Is is that a correct uh, stat that I got? I, I would tell you the Mosney paper makers uh, was not professional. It's uh, kind of a senior A. Um, deal it's a league and it's a good league my son is actually playing in it right now for a team in uh, uh eagle river and so that's kind of a full circle because people still kind of remember me for it mos and e uh and so yeah i played in that on weekends and when i could while I was still coaching at stevens point and then we won the league and then went on and played in u.s nationals senior and we won um, national uh, title with uh, Mosin that season. So it was fun. We had a great team. A lot of college guys, a lot of guys who had played uh, professionally. And so we had a good core. That was uh, a lot of fun and made me more calm as a coach because I would be exhausted after skating around a while having not played. So I was but, wondering, guys, did, 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 did you have an interest in playing another season or did your body um, send you a message saying, basically, that's it, I'm done, we're, we're, we're not going to do this anymore? I think from a timing standpoint, I ended up uh, taking the assistant job at uh, uh, St. Cloud. And so that's why I didn't continue to play with them because uh, I really did enjoy skating. It was, we'd practice once a week on a Wednesday night, you know, and then, uh, like I said, I'd play on the occasional Sunday or weekends when I could and then uh post our season I was able to play playoffs and finish up the year and play in national so gotcha. it was uh it was nice I, I enjoyed it I'd still love to play I just don't always have the time or um you know can find a group where uh, that works for me Perfect. Well, you know, there's always men's league somewhere that you can play in, I'm sure. Um, all right. So uh, tell me how you ended up at uh, being the head coach at North Dakota. Obviously, you were at St. Cloud State for a year, um, but how did the uh, the opportunity arise? Uh, you know, I really just applied. And I, I, you know, applied with the expectation of uh, if I got an interview, that would be uh, terrific and good experience and that uh, you know there are a lot of people who had applied and were interested in that job and um, yeah I, I was just fortunate and uh, when they announced the final three I was like wow I have a real shot at getting this job so um, yeah just got the opportunity and, and ran with it and uh, it was fun building that program up it was significantly different than what it is building up a college program now um but uh yeah it was a lot of fun i enjoyed my time at north dakota and obviously that facility is Hengelstad arena now having been around the world is still one of the greatest facilities um anywhere uh and so uh, it was a great experience learned a lot and you know, got to coach some pretty elite players in, in my time and uh get to the ncaa tournament and so it was good stuff. All right. So I got a few uh, North Dakota related questions. So first of all, you mentioned some okay. amazing players that you were able to coach. So let's just talk about the two most impressive ones, at least that folks that are very well aware of. Talk about how you were able to recruit the Lamaru twins and what made them so special. So timing wise, the, the twins were 
coming out and North Dakota was in existence for five years there. North Dakota kids, Grand Forks kids, um, you know, a family went there, mom went there, dad went there, brothers went there. So very tied into, you know, the culture and the university and, uh, but the team wasn't very good. So I had gotten to know them a little bit, working some USA hockey camps at 14 and 15 years old. Um, never dreaming that like I would be coaching, you know, them or have the opportunity to coach them. And it was pretty obvious to see even at that age that they were something special, not only with, uh, you know, their ability to play hockey, but just their mentality and their compete levels um, was, uh, was special. And so, um, I came in and obviously their freshman year is at Minnesota. Um, and then we started to show some um, progress with what we were doing at North Dakota. And I think at, at that point with them going to take the year off for the Olympics, um, they felt like that North Dakota would and could be uh, an opportunity for them to come home and really help build that program. So. I mean, to this day, there's still not a person in Grand Forks that doesn't take some responsibility for them coming back and transferring. So I, I can't take any credit for that uh, because I think everyone in town, every time they saw him, was like, you should come home. You should come home. It'd be awesome for you to play here. So, um, And with that being said, I, I guess that's the part that kind of still bothers me with the whole they came back to leave a legacy and to build a program and, and to win and put uh, uh, North Dakota women's hockey on the map. And so for that to not have a program is a little disheartening, especially for them, because they could have easily stayed somewhere else and won national championships and played for Wisconsin or stayed at Minnesota. Um, but they chose to come back. And that also is very rare. Um, to take that path uh, that's uh, a little less traveled and to have the confidence that you could be difference makers uh, to build up a program from, you know, where it was at that time to something that was pretty special. Gotcha. All right. So I, I, I can go in two paths. I'm going to come back to the Lamro Twins in a moment because you, you you did talk about, uh, you know, the that the North Dakota eliminated the program, um, you know, similar to Robert Morris. Um, I had Logan Biddle on the podcast a couple of years ago um, when it was announced that they were coming back. Um, but he described the situation where the athletic director had his own agenda and just decided to he didn't like hockey and eliminated, you know, the program and didn't really give any opportunity to either of the programs there to, uh, to to try and find a way to financially solve the money issue. Um, and then he almost immediately left the school. So my understanding is, and so therefore he didn't have to even live with the consequences of his own decision. I was just wondering, you know, like, you know, um, you know, why did they eliminate the program at UND? And do you think there's any chance that it makes a comeback? Given that you got a, that, like you mentioned, the $350 million uh, Ralph Engelstad arena there. Um, and I know they're still continuing to invest in it and even re-up it this year. Um, so a lot to unpack there. Uh, it, ours wasn't an athletic director. Ours was a president. So there was some uh, budgetary uh, concerns at the state level. Um, we had a new president who had some uh, views on athletics and uh, the school at the whole and had a view and he was going to remake uh, the university. And so some of those cuts probably went further than needed to. But that's what he wanted to do. So coming down the pipe, women's hockey was never, because this process played out over the course of over a year in regards to the cuts. And we were never on the table, uh, not part of the conversation. There were a group of sports that, that were. Um, and then when the final decision came down, yeah, at the end of the day, similar, he made the decision what he thought was best for the school and he cut women's hockey. And uh, I think he was gone from the university in another year or two. Mm, such a disappointment. Well, hopefully some folks uh, can figure out a way to, to do a comeback given all the, the, the amazing growth of the women's game at both the college and the uh, professional level now. So hopefully some folks in North Dakota can help figure that out. Um, just like the folks in Michigan should be figuring that one out too. 
So um, I'm going to shift back to the Lamlu twins. So um, I'm going to follow yeah. up on the question that I asked you is, what made them so special? Oh, they, their ability to do work every day over a long period of time. So there's no like rocket science to being elite. It's just having the patience and ability to trust in yourself. You're going to figure it out and you're going to do whatever is required. So th those kids, you know, it, it, when people talk about being the first on the ice and last off the ice, it seems cliche, but like, that's what they did. And they did that over the course of four plus years with North Dakota and prior to that as youth players. And you start adding up those hours and that time and that focus practice, they didn't need to go out and shoot extra pucks. They both have great shots, but they did. You know, they didn't need to put in a lot of time with uh, uh, their skating, but, you know, they did. So it was just very interesting to be in and around and have a front row seat to watch their process and their work at the place. I tell a lot of people like they, they weren't the biggest kids, like, you know, five, six, there's a lot of kids bigger than them. They, they weren't the strongest kids. Um, there were kids on our team who lifted more weights, um, but there was no one that was going to out compete them and outwork them. And do you think it helped that they had older brothers who basically treated them oh. as equals and 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 did not give them any an inch when they competed directly against each other? Well, I mean that whole family is special. They're all driven. They're all competitive. They all have been very successful. Um, you know, her goaltender uh, brother is still playing overseas. It he's got to be pushing almost forty. Um, you know, Hobie Baker award winner, you know, and you know, mom's running marathons and dad's a national championship hockey player. Like it, it's that, that whole family is just wired a certain way to compete and do their best in all they do. And, um, you know, that's why they're successful. Amazing. All right. Um, so, uh, you've been around women's hockey now for coming up on almost 20 years. So how has women's college hockey changed in that period of time? Just the amount of depth, the player pool, and the overall skill level is uh, is kind of when I sit back and watch, it kind of blows me away at uh, just how much the game has improved. Um, and a lot of that is uh, better coaches at younger ages, um, you know, skill coaches, individual uh, coaches working on players' games outside of normal practice, um, the exposure to strength and conditioning. Um, it's just uh, the whole game, you know, from the men's side to the women's side, it's just uh, amazing how far it's grown, how fast it is, how skilled. Um, so yeah, it's been very cool to, uh, kind of be a part of that and watch that transition. And, and what specifically about the women's game in terms of how they play the game is, has changed the most? Just the speed, the speed of it, um, and the ability to make plays within speed has changed a, a lot. Um, shooting a puck was always a weakness in the early uh, advent of women's hockey, so a team could really just kind of pack in four or five people in the slot and keep you on the perimeter, and it would be super hard to score. Um, I don't, you can't do that now. You just can't. And um, so the early years also, like the elite kids were so much better than everybody else that if you had a third line out against an elite player, they're going to score. It's going to end up in the back of your net. You just couldn't do that. You had very few kids who could match up with the top 1%. Growth-wise now, um, the elite players, we still have players now on a fourth line, you know, 650 that uh, can take some shifts and uh, still compete and defend. Um, and uh, that's a huge change for what it was years and years ago. So uh, gotcha. I think that's been fun to see that kind of growth and the player pool just explode. You know, the difference between 
in any recruiting class now, player number 10 to 120, there, there's not a lot of difference. That's great to hear. And, and obviously it'll keep going now as, uh, as the, 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 the top of the funnel key continues to expand um, at, yeah. uh, at the youth level. So, um, you know, we can do a whole uh, episode just on your um, period of time coaching in China. Um, but I just want to touch on a couple of questions on there. So um, how did your international experience, and especially in China with all the travel and all the uh, international players and the language challenges and things like that, um, how did that help you improve as a coach? Oh, just being able to communicate, you know, um, as we had players from Russia, we had players from China, we had players from uh, Finland, uh, Sweden, Czech Republic, um, Canada, U.S. Um, we had players from all over the world. And so how do you get that group on the same page? How do you get that group to understand what we're asking them to do and execute and play as a group of five? Um yeah, that was good uh, growth for me and being able to slow down and really explain in detail what we are looking for and what needed to be done. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it. Overall, it was a great experience. Yeah, and talk about uh, coaching the uh, Chinese women team at the Beijing Winter Olympics. I know it wasn't the regular Olympics because the, uh, the, the arenas weren't full, but uh, what was your biggest takeaway from uh, being able to coach at the international level um, in, in the Olympics? So it's very interesting because uh, right, TV makes everything larger than life. So, I mean, the rink's still the same. The, the boards, the dimensions, even everything kind of going in and around the game uh, is the same. But it just, you know, having the Olympic rings there and some of the television, it just kind of made it uh, an entirely different experience. Um, and so, uh, it was very interesting going through that. And so it was a little different, obviously we're playing games without COVID and in front of, uh, 20,000 Chinese fans, uh, yelling, screaming, that's probably a different environment, uh, than what we were doing. But, uh, I was kind of taken aback by it being bigger in your minds coming in than what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a hockey game. And, uh, you know, how do we control our emotions and, and play and execute, you know, just like every other hockey game we've been in up until that point. Gotcha. Well, I'd love to ask you more questions on, on your time in China, but we gotta, we got to move on to St. Cloud State. So maybe just talk about how you end up uh, becoming the coach of St. Cloud State, um, given, you know, that you were overseas and obviously there was an opening uh, in St. Cloud. Yeah, well, post-Olympics, uh, finished the season with uh, the Chinese professional team in Russia and just everything going on in the world. It was, uh, it had run its course. It was time to come back home. So um, family-wise, everything else, uh, St. Cloud State was just a, a super fit for me. I still have a couple of uh, my boys in and North Dakota, one of my boys is in Minnesota, one of my boys and my mom's in Wisconsin. And so we were kind of smack dab in the middle of all of them. So, and again, to be back in the WCHA, to compete at the highest levels um, collegiately, um, that was appealing. That's, that's fun for me. I enjoy that. I'm a pretty competitive person by nature. Gotcha. So let's let's talk about St. Cloud State, the school. Um, my understanding is that the uh, the university's enrollment has fallen quite a bit over the last uh, ten years or so by by about six thousand students. Um, but you're finally they've kind of finally kind of flattened off this year. But that's also had some you know budget implications and and reducing some of the uh, the the uh, majors that uh, folks can take. So I'm just wondering, you know, maybe you could just talk about the school. There's about 10,000 students and, um, uh, you know, what it's like to go to school at St. Cloud. Yeah, for sure. So St. Cloud, similar to some things that were going on at North Dakota, uh, was going through a phase where, you know, budgetarily we have to figure some things out. And uh, so our enrollment is now back uh, on the rise post COVID. Um, and so, you know, the next couple of years are going to be, uh, very interesting for us as we reinvest in athletics, number one, and two, uh, reinvest in academic programs that are 
you know, the super importance of the school and things that we do really well. So it's a pretty uh, interesting uh, opportunity and time for us. And that was one of the things, you know, when people ask, well, what did you see? I knew that St. Cloud State was uh, about to rebound and bounce uh, both with campus and what's going on in campus and the academic programs, but most importantly, uh, the athletic programs and the reinvestment into uh, making us uh, competitive. Gotcha. And uh, maybe just talk about the facilities. I, I've been to the, the, the to St. Cloud. I've been to the rink, obviously, for some USA hockey events. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, maybe just talk about how Herb Brooks kind of basically built the, the arena and, and how that and, and what kind of facilities you have, because I know it's quite impressive. Yeah, so two Olympic sheets. We're in the process of uh, working with the state, actually, to uh, redo the rink and facility. A few years back, uh, we redid locker rooms and uh, weight room and uh, front entrance uh, to make that better. But uh, the Olympic size sheets never really caught on or changed the game like everybody thought uh, post 80 Olympics. And uh, everyone thought that that was going to open the game up and make it uh, just so much faster and entertaining. And Quite honestly, that didn't really happen. It kind of made it more boring. Coaches just kept people inside the dots and let people be on the exterior with possession. And uh, what we've come to find is a smaller rink and uh, people bouncing into each other creates turnovers and quicker transition and opportunities. So we're hoping to uh, shrink uh, the back rink uh, to an NHL size uh, and make uh, the main sheet more of a hybrid where it's in between uh, NHL and Olympic. And so hopefully uh, the next uh, year and a half, uh, we can make some of those changes and fix some of the seating as well. And um, so, like I said, it's, it's a good opportunity. I knew some of these things were on the horizon for us. And so, it's a fun time to uh, to be here and uh, be able to help our program grow and improve and uh, be competitive. And so, um, yeah, good stuff. And and I mean, the the turnaround that you had with the team was almost immediate and incredibly impressive. Um, and now you're, um, you know, a top 10 team uh, within two years. Last year, you're even uh, an amazing season as well. I'm just wondering, what was the biggest thing that you changed when you got to the program that led to, to your success? Um, it was just communicating where they were, what they wanted, listening to them of what... So when you take over, there's always, you start with having conversations with everybody on the phone because they're not all here. And you start asking questions about what do you personally love about St. Cloud? What do you love about the team that you 100% should never change? And then what are some opportunities for some things that, uh, you know, you don't want to see happen next year and how can we make things better? And so those are very interesting conversations when you go through the whole team um, because, again, I think some of that's unconscious knowledge. People know what should happen and what needs to happen. It's being guided, held accountable, and kind of shown the work that goes into that. that and that was always my fear. Everyone says they want some of these things, they want change, but are you really willing to put the work in that it takes? And uh, I, everyone I talk to, credit goes to the players. I kind of told them what it looks like. I kind of guided them through the process, shared some information, but they have to show up every day. They have to put the work in and they have. It. So they get to see the fruits of their labor for their sacrifice and their willingness to do things that, uh, they weren't necessarily doing before I got here. And when you asked them those two questions, what was your the biggest surprise that you got from those answers? I wasn't surprised. I've just been, this is like my fourth program that I've kind of stepped into. And so um, the, the answers are always the same. When something is not going right in an organization, the reasons are always the same. And it's communication, clearly stating where you're going, who you are, and what you need to do. 
uh, giving them a voice and having them feel valued. Like these are all kind of basics, human traits that any successful organization is doing when it goes well and they're not doing when it goes wrong. So gotcha. I wasn't surprised by a lot of that stuff because it's, it's the same. Gotcha. Beautiful. So, uh, so at least you knew the playbook coming in, what you needed to do. Um, so given that, and given your, uh, all the experience that you have, you play in the WCHA, which is by far the toughest conference in women's college hockey. Currently you're fourth in the WCHA, um, only 10th in the country, but if they actually did it based on actual, you know, uh, strength of schedule, given that, you know, uh, every game that you play in the WCHA is a really tough one. I'm just wondering, what does it take to 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 compete against these Big Ten schools that are just um, recruiting powerhouses? Um, and you know, you may not be recruiting the same level of player, but you're still playing against them every week. What what does it take to compete against them? Well, there's no doubt that what they're doing financially and what they have is not coming down anytime soon when you look at the ramifications of TV contracts and the expansion of football and basketball and these super conferences and what it means to be power five. But hockey's super interesting in this regard where you have division three institutions playing up. You have division two institutions playing up and they can compete um, because of culture and work ethic and so talent is one thing and it sure helps i <laughs> i don't want to make any mistakes in that that uh you have to have talent to, to be successful but it's not the the be all end all it really isn't there's a lot of other things that go into it and um that's why schools who you know don't have that same profile when it comes to financials still can be competitive Gotcha. So um, maybe can you talk about how um, uh, uh, NIL dollars um, work and, uh, you know, how they you know, play a role with uh, your recruiting for St. Cloud State? Uh, and, and for folks who don't know, NIL is name, image, and likeness, and it's a way of uh, student athletes of being able to make money on their own um, while they're still at, uh, you know, competing at the collegiate level. Right. So this was not a thing my first go around in college athletics. So this is still relatively new and especially new for me. So uh, I think what schools do is they kind of now partner up with uh, people who kind of help with their websites and kind of put their names out there so that they can uh, receive, you know, uh, money for someone using their image in some kind of marketing campaign. So for us, we've had a few players uh, with uh, the hospital in town who has uh, used their their images or pictures of them to promote, uh, uh, you know, the, the hospital and things like that. So it's definitely uh, a part of the equation now, which is kind of uh, crazy. It, it's good for the athletes. You see a lot of things spawn out of that where their athletes are starting charities and they're using uh, the ability of, um, you know, their image to promote things that are important to them and special to them. I think it gets a little out of whack um, when you start looking at some of the major sports of what that is. Is it filtering into women's hockey? A little bit, but it's not as bad as what you know, uh, football paying a quarterback a uh, million dollars so he can uh, come back for one more season instead of going to the draft. Gotcha. Yeah, no, definitely a different level of uh, compensation at the football and basketball level than at the hockey level right now. Um, all right. So um, a couple of episodes ago, we had Elizabeth Wolf from UConn on the podcast, and she talked about how UConn does personality tests to help with, um, you know, assessing people's communication styles and how to communicate with each other and the staff. Um, my understanding is you use uh, something called the DISC assessment. Uh, maybe just talk about how uh, you use that tool to help with, um, you know, uh, do some team building and, and communication. Yeah, so uh, we're basically on a pretty similar program, having known that staff for a while. And uh, so it, it's the same. It just helps us recruiting-wise, targeting a mentality that we want. And it also helped when we came in to have conversations about communication and to understand that 
not everyone's hearing the message the same way or processing information the same way when we talk to the group. And it's why that, you know, you can have one side nodding their head and chomping at the bit and you can have the other group kind of, you know, eh, I'm not really sure how I feel about that. And so understanding those differences and just being open to acknowledging them and also making sure that when you are delivering a message, you're speaking in such a way that it resonates with uh, all groups on your club, just not uh, part of them. So gotcha. yeah, it is it is super cool. And it's very interesting because I personally have done the disc three separate times. And when I retook it recently, I kind of thought, okay, you know, it's been about 15 years. I'm a little older, a little wiser, a little more mature. Um, but it came back exactly the same. And I was really kind of floored by that. So I thought that was, uh, uh, very interesting. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, it's another tool to help your team and to help, uh, foster conversations and, uh, have them kind of be open, uh, to each other and their differences. So I do have to follow up on that one then. So if you're the same, sure. if you're the same evaluation as you were many years ago, um, but you feel like you're probably a better coach and, and a slightly different coach over that period of time, just because of experiences has, has, you know, changed who you are. Um, I'm just wondering how does that manifest itself from being who you are as a core person versus how you coach over, you know, a 10 or 15 year period? Right. So, cause I asked, I'm like, I, I really thought that yeah, this would be different. He says, yeah, your, your, your personality type and like who you are. And so this graph goes on, like who you are is one part of it. And then like how you relate to the world around you. And I, they're like, they kind of laugh. They go, cause you, you're the same. So like, you, you're not like, you don't put on one face here and then but at your core you're something else they they kind of chuckled and said like you know you are, are the are, are both like that's just who you are it doesn't matter the situation the people you're around like you're you're true to who you really are so how that's impacted me coaching even though i feel like i'm uh, uh older a little wiser is just you go through enough games, you play in enough avenues, there's almost a sense of calm because been there, done that. Gotcha. So it, it's uh, it's almost like re-watching a, a movie, you kind of know what's next and you kind of see what's coming. And so you understand it a little more. Perfect. All right. So I'm, I'm now going to get back to your team. Um, so just looking at your roster, um, you have several older players on your team, at least certainly experienced players on your team. Um, you have some great goaltending, and yet you also have 28 players on your roster. I'm wondering, um, has that large of a roster helped you in terms of the depth on the team and therefore um, being able to put the, the best 20 or 21 players on the ice every night? Um, and how do you manage uh, such a large roster? Uh, perfect. So this is something I did at North Dakota and something I started here as well. Anytime you're going through a transition and last year, we didn't have a lot of depth. I, I really felt like we kind of ran out of gas a little bit at the end of the year. We were playing some of our top players, uh, way too much to be competitive. And so we brought some players in who have the right mentality, um, that we're looking for. Uh, and so very early on, we kind of looked at them and said, listen, I, this is going to be a development year for you. Um, you're not going to be in the lineup. You're not going to play. Uh, you are going to redshirt. Um, and in that redshirt year, now you're going to have extra workouts. You're going to have extra skill skates. You're going to practice with the team and be a part of everything that we do. But now we're putting on you a little more of a development track instead of you coming in and worrying about where you fit in or only playing in a couple games. You're coming in, your focus is to become a better athlete, become a better hockey player. And so, it, it, yes, 28, but I would tell you that uh, uh, five of them are are red shirting and so we're, we're around that 23 24 of what's eligible to play on any given weekend 
now if I got myself into some serious uh, injury trouble, you know, we may activate one of them, but they kind of came in with the mindset and the knowledge of uh, this was, we were taking a longer term at their development and what was best for them uh, to be hockey players. And um, more importantly, be contributing hockey players for us. Gotcha. So you, you mentioned these were the kind of players that you wanted to bring into the program and that it was a development opportunity for you. Um, I, the way I understand it, character is extremely important to you uh, on who you recruit. So how do you evaluate the character of the players that you're, you, you want to bring in? So that part's super hard. I think anybody can walk into a rink ray and go, wow, that kid's super talented and the best kid on the ice and a good athlete. That That's easy. Okay. Uh, and quite honestly, we're, we're not getting those kids like and so now how do you find that next tier of kid who may not have the a skill right now but has the a mentality work ethic uh and grit to persevere and work on their game all the time um and that's what we're trying to target and it's conversations and you kind of start to see the patterns when you start talking to people like hardest working kid I've ever had, like grittiest kid, always wins battles, don't know how. Um, and quite honestly, having a lot of conversations uh, with kids and they have to uh, have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, feel like they were overlooked a little bit, that uh, they're just as good as other players that seem to garner all the attention all the time. There has to be, and most elite players have that, they have that little fire where um, they feel some perceived slight that kind of just continues to propel them to work hard at their craft and to keep going and to keep uh, doing what's necessary for them to be successful. That's kind of what we look for. And that's, uh, you know, kids that I've had a ton of success with um, because I just understand that mentality that's required to do that. Beautiful. All right. So that, that explains a lot, uh, especially it's, figuring out who's got the chip on the shoulder. Not hard to tell because they'll, they'll tell you that. Uh, that they, what they a lot of times. They, yeah. <laughs> a lot of times. Yeah. 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 And so that's, uh, yeah, there, there's, again, I, I don't think that that's um, rocket science, but you know, it's, we're very honest and, um, the recruiting process, like this place is not for everybody because we are going to work hard and we are going to sacrifice and we are going to do extra workouts and we're going to take care of our bodies and we're going to rest and sleep and do all the little intangibles that elite players do. Well, that, that really isn't for everybody. Gotcha. You know, there's a lot. There's a lot of kids who say that, oh, okay, yeah. but like when push comes to shove, they want to have fun. They want to have a social life. They want to do some other things. They want to experience a big city and go out. And we are clearly not that. So very, very particular type of uh, player that you're looking for that would be a fit for you guys. So um, let me let me get, move on to the last couple of recruiting related questions. So I notice you have a lot of Western Canadian players, uh, especially uh, over the years you've had uh, players from Winnipeg and Alberta, obviously North Dakota, Minnesota. But obviously you have a lot of international players, in particular your All Star goalie from Finland. Um, I was wondering if your international experience in China kind of helped you from a recruiting perspective and from just a coaching perspective uh, bring in these international and and you know uh, outside of Minnesota players. Well, obviously, um, I at North Dakota, we were following a, a pretty similar formula. Uh, so, you know, talent is important. Um, you look at the young players who are national team players at a younger age or in that cycle or elite U18 kids for um, the U.S. and Canada. Those kids are following similar paths. Predictably so, to about four or five different schools. So we can't compete with that. We hadn't been able to compete with that. So where are some opportunities uh, to get an elite player 
cuts uh, off the beaten path a little bit overseas typically and it's a lot more work so you know not everybody uh is up with that or has the connections or will go through the kind of the paperwork process to, to do that though it's definitely opened up a lot more um since my first go around with uh european players for sure and um so that's still what we're kind of doing as far as uh, looking at uh, players from overseas uh, to come in and kind of, uh, you know, be uh, better higher end players for us. Gotcha. All right. Last question for you. Um, what advice do you have for players or parents uh, or parents of players who, who want to play D1 hockey um, and especially play at the highest level like the WCHA? Huh. So to be elite, there are a couple different things you need to do. One, you need to align yourself with someone who knows what it looks like to advance to the higher levels. So, um, you know, having a coach that's played, been there, coached at the higher levels, super helpful to have that kind of mentorship. Um, you have to put yourself in an environment. This sometimes becomes very hard. Uh, for younger players and their families where everyone is driven and wants to do it for real. If you're in an environment where you want to practice hard and you want to do extra and you're the only one, you kind of feel like an outlier and you almost get made to feel weird for wanting to be elite. That's super hard. And there are a lot of environments where that's the case and very few environments where it's flipped. In college, especially here, it's going to be flipped where if you're, you don't want to work hard, like, yeah, no, this, the, you're the outlier. and uh, That's got to be a weird feeling. So finding an environment where um, that's the case, where everyone's driven, you know, and you've got four or five other kids that are pushing you and wanting to do extra with you, uh, that's super important uh, coming up. And, and lastly, I would say be targeted with showcases and exposure things that you want to do. You only need one or two. You don't need to do 10. You don't need to pay somebody to send an email for you. Um, focus on development focus on getting bigger stronger faster it's our job to find you and if you're a player we're going to find you perfect all right well and especially the advice on uh, surrounding yourselves with uh, people who who really want to will push you and push themselves that is a uh, great advice because when i uh, speak to a lot of parents i hear a lot of situations where they haven't put their that the kids haven't put themselves in a situation to be seen or pushing themselves. So, and they're surprised with, uh, you know, that they're not getting the attention that they're expecting. So some excellent advice, Brian, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It was great learning about your, your playing career, definitely your amazing coaching journey from all the different stops that you've been at and obviously learning about St. Cloud state and obviously the, uh, uh the, the advice that you've just been giving about uh, what it takes to really be successful. So thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, I appreciate uh, the invite. Always uh, great to talk hockey. So keep doing what you're doing. I really want to thank Brian for coming on the podcast. He had some great insights on how the women's college game has changed, what it takes to build a successful program, and of course, some excellent recruiting advice. You can connect with Brian on the Huskies website or his Champs app profile. Links to both are in the show notes.